Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. Uh, today I'd like to discuss briefly mind and specifically um, thinking about the Diamond Sutra and those famous concluding words that, as we know, hit our sixth ancestor of Zen in the very marrow of his bones, so to speak. Let your mind flow free, attaching to nothing. So how do we do so? Well, we are taught in Buddhism to watch our inflows and outflows. And what do we see when we observe them? How often we experience anxieties, fears, depression, all of these things bubbling up and dominating our state of mind, doubts, fears. In my case, for example, sometimes I have an inexplicable sense of doom. So how do we keep these mental states from becoming worse and becoming obstacles in our lives and in our practice. Of course, a lot of advice is given these days about how to make them disappear, how to turn away negative thoughts and cultivate positive ones or convert them into positive thoughts. But does any of that stuff really work? Well, let's take a look at mind itself and I'm sure that you've been doing that for some time. Mind's nature is endless creation. The mind can be compared to the sun, which continuously generates photons or rays. Now those rays can affect us all in different ways. It can warm us, the, the, a ray can warm us, it can blind us, it can cause wildfires, it can nourish us. But the sun can't be controlled or censored. We can't just cut out a piece of it because it beats down on the dry areas of California, because that would compromise its integrity. So we simply make the necessary adjustments to live with it. Of course, we can use sunscreen, we can work to prevent and mitigate fires. There are a lot of things that we can do. Well, likewise, we can't just cut out the thoughts and feelings that we deem to be negative uh, simply because they make us feel lousy. We need to acknowledge and embrace the integrity of mind as the creative force it is. And that's how we unleash our genius. And yet, the majority of our habitual thoughts tend to be negative. And how do we respond to these repetitive patterns. Well, psychology calls these arising thought forms and reoccurring thought patterns affects. Um, what it means by that is that these are not just isolated thoughts in the intellect, but rather they're bundles of thoughts, narratives, emotions, associations, bodily sensations, behavioral reactions. Eckhart Tolle, for example, taking um, a cue from parts therapy, notes that the trauma that we experience in life builds up until it takes on an energy or life of its own, becomes like a little persona. And he calls that energy bundle that in which we hold our pain, the pain body. So we might as well look at it as a little persona, if we will, our petulant wounded child. What does it want? Well, it wants to be heard. It wants to be seen. It has all of this energy that it needs to release. It needs to assert itself. And it's triggered, as we all know, by certain situations. Uh, and we act out reflectively when that happens. Of course, that can be problematic. So how do we deal with these, these arising uh, energetic parts? Are we just enslaved to them? 
are we the victims of our neural programming? Should we try to control them, stop them, divert them, ignore them? How do we deal with it? Uh, one way, of course, is that we could try to lobotomize them away. So in cognitive terms, that would mean two things. First of all, we would stigmatize certain arising thoughts as negative. And then we work to counter them in some way. We intervene, maybe by uh, denying or suppressing them or mindlessly acting out or papering them over with positive, useful, skillful thoughts that we manufacture. Stigmatize and combat. But there is also another approach, an opposite approach we could take. Um, think about your pain body arising and think of it as a child crying for attention in pain. How would we respond to that child? I know that for myself, I judge myself. I judge it. Oh, this is ego. And it's illegitimate. And I tend to, that's a knee-jerk reaction. It's selfish. It's ignorant. It's some false thing that needs to be destroyed before I can awaken. But if we view it as a small, frightened child within us, and it is a voice of that, we can possibly see ourselves in childhood experiencing some separation anxiety when left alone. We can think about probably a specific time in our lives where we had to fend on our own and we were scared. It was likely not intended by our parents, but a sense of abandonment probably took you over. And how did we feel that? Well, probably in the core of our small, fragile body and mind. Maybe in the pit of the stomach a feeling in the head. Now think for a moment how we might talk to that traumatized child as the caring adult that you have become today. What words would you use with that child? I think you might try to be a little more reassuring perhaps and show that child that he or she isn't isolated and alone, but has the resources to survive the threat, would we be able to put that child's grief in perspective for them? And how does that sync up with our usual inner self-talk? Are we that kind to ourselves? If our adult self met that poor child today, would we continue to taunt that child? Now, what would be the consequences of that kind of damaging talk to a traumatized child? What impacts would that have on our body, mind, and behaviors? Disorders that develop range from ADHD, ADD, PTSD. Something I've recently learned is called oppositional defiance disorder, dissociation. Condemning a pain child doesn't heal, it complicates. So the first problem arises from our negative judgment of whatever it is that happens to arise in our minds. So our first step would logically be to suspend judgment, untangle the negative associations and reactions. Look into and learn to shake off prejudgments and opinions. If we are instead curious about that child or that voice, that affect, then we can awaken to its origins a little better and heal the suffering. So the first step I, I believe is to suspend judgment. Now, once we stop the negative uh, the labeling, we can acknowledge that small crying voice. And of course, in our practice, we have a model for that Quan Seum or Quan Yin. Of course, Quan Seum means hearing the world's cries. So our second step would be to listen compassionately and receptively. 
just to be present and compassionate for that suffering part. And this could be enough to dissipate the energy that had formerly been continually arising as annoying hindrances. And it would help us to unwind those obstructive cognitive affective associations and free our minds to flow more freely. So the third step, as I view it, would be that we would experience all arising phenomena as part of a larger whole. If we can see the suffering of a child as all of humanity and our own suffering as that of all of humanity, maybe we will be a little less self-cherishing and self-centered. Maybe we will no longer discriminate as much. It's not that we exchange another's needs for our own, but that we have released the clinging to our own crying voice. So through our mindful practice, we can open, accept, and allow the stream of creative awareness to flow. And we can find ourselves at a higher perspective like the eagle soaring above the clouds, seeing those thought forms as the clouds arising in the sky. Um, that's why, of course, in our literature, quite often the mind is compared to open sky. It is the spaciousness from which thoughts and forms arise. So when we allow our mind to flow freely, we are in sync with its true function. Its nature is to flow, endlessly creating, and we share that nature. So, as long as we are in sync with the rough situations we encounter and our responses to it, we can flow more freely with it and experience optimal function. After all, the term dukkha is derived from a wheel out of alignment. It's not in sync. Thank you. <laughs>